Hello everyone. From the title, you may be wondering what history and geography have to do with Bechet's disease. Over the next five minutes, I'll try and convince you that history, geography and indeed medicine are quite closely related. We all know that Bechet's disease is a multi-system vasculitis characterized by recurrent oral and genital ulcers. Unusually for an autoimmune condition, it's more common in males. It usually affects young adults. This was the gentleman who first described the condition in 1936, Dr. Hulushi Petschet, who was a Turkish physician. What he reported was the association of oral and genital ulcers, which were recurrent and associated with uveitis. Since his initial description, a variety of other manifestations have been recorded. There are now strict guidelines as to what manifestation should be present uh, as described by the International Study Group of Betchets. Note that all the manifestations are clinical with no laboratory investigations. So going on to the etiopathogenesis of Betchets disease, there are two main factors, genetic and environmental factors. Of the genetic factors, HLA B51 is the most important. It seems to be predominant in those who have Betchets disease with 60% of patients having this allele. If you have this allele, you also seem to have a more severe form of the disease as uveitis and central nervous system involvement is commoner. Secondly, there are infectious agents which have been postulated. We know it's not contagious, but infectious agents like Streptococcus sanguinis have been found in increasing concentrations in the mouth and herpes simplex DNA has been found in the mononuclear cells of those with Betchett's. Let's go on to the history and geography. Why do we need to know history? As Winston Churchill once said, the farther back you can look, the farther forward you can see. We need to go back 5,000 years to the birth of silk. This is the cocoon of the silkworm, otherwise called Bombyx mori. The silkworm feeds only on the white mulberry plant. And this combination of the silkworm with the white mulberry plant was found exclusively in Northwest China. Empress Si Ling Shi in 2600 BC was the one who is venerated as the goddess of silk because she is the one who found it first. She was having a cup of tea under the mulberry plant and one of the cocoons fell into her tea, her hot tea. The cocoon unraveled to form fine filaments and she then wove it to make the first silk thread. The Chinese used silk to make a variety of products, paper and clothes, and it became a key component of their economy. China was relatively isolated from the rest of the world but till the first century BC but at this point the Han dynasty ruled China. Emperor Wu wanted to use silk as a commodity and so he sent envoys towards the west and this opened a path from China to the rest of the world and which became called the Silk Route. The Silk Route reached its peak between the 8th and the 10th century and at this point, it was 4,500 miles long from the east to the west. It extended from northwest China all the way to the Mediterranean. It was the information superhighway of its time. And not only commerce, but ideas were also exchanged. It was now the 13th century and Genghis Khan overran most of Asia. He now created the biggest empire the world has ever seen. But as he, after him, the Chinese started to lose power and the Silk Route started to wane. There are many reasons for the decline of the Silk Route. There was increased Chinese nationalism, Islam was on the ascendancy in the Middle East and this led to physical and political barriers all along the route. Silk production was also starting to manufacture outside China. But finally and most importantly, there was the establishment of the Sea Route between Europe and Asia. Sea travel was a lot safer and you could ship larger amounts. And in the Middle Ages, in the Central Asian part, there was increased political insecurity and therefore the Silk Route started to wane. So in the end, the geography of the area really conspired against the Silk Route. Bustling towns and uh, cities fell into ruin and all we can see now are vast expanses of desert land. So what's the link between the Silk Route and Bechet's disease? If you look on the top left, that shows the highest incidence of Bechet's disease in the world and that's a strip of land from China to Turkey. On the bottom right, you can see 
it corresponds almost exactly to the silk route. So is this a coincidence or can we explain it scientifically? For this we need to go back to the etiopathogenesis. We mentioned two main factors, infectious agents and HLA-B51. So let's assume that Betchett's disease has an infectious etiology or prop is propagated by or the immunology is propagated by the infectious agent. Just like the plague came from Europe into Asia in the Middle Ages, and unknown infectious agents may be predisposing these people to get Betchett's disease in this particular area. If there are other factors which are also conducive to the development of this disease. Secondly, genetic factors. If you look at the population with the highest HLA B51 concentration, it again is in exactly the same strip of land between China and Turkey. So again, it could be hypothesized that this area was occupied by people with a higher incidence of HLA B51 and that was propagated through the generations making it an increased susceptibility and a risk factor if other environmental factors and immunological factors were conducive to the development of the disease. So you can see that Betchett's disease etiopathogenesis is like a giant zigzag puzzle and we can solve the zigzag puzzle only if we have knowledge of the history and geography. So I'd like to end with words of wisdom from William Osler. He said, by the historical methods alone can many of the integral problems of medicine be profitably approached. If you have any comments or would like to share any doubts, please do post them down and I'll try and respond to them as soon as possible. Thank you.